Terry Atherin Nichols, um, welcome to the channel and thank you very much for joining me today. I'm glad to be here, Matt. Thank you. Fantastic. Perhaps we can jump in straight to it and you can tell me more about yourself and the journey throughout your life. Well, the short version, we could go into a few hours. Uh, <laughs> short version is uh, I was uh, born and raised uh, to think I was a four, fourth generation uh, mainstream society white person, right? And uh, it wasn't until I was 46 years old that I found out I'm in fact Native American. And it really changed my focus in life because up until that point, I knew there was something more, uh, but I wasn't really sure what something more represented. And, and um, I'm reading, I'm writing a series of, of books on that uh, journey, and that's where you get Earthwind. Uh, Gado Onule is uh, Chickamauga, which is my uh, tribe, uh, and it, it means earth wind or his breath across the earth. So that's where that came from. And I'm also being of very low economic means and not having any money to go to college after high school. Um, I joined the Navy to see the world, the US Navy, and that's exactly what I did for 20 years. While I was in, I met and married my, my first wife. Uh, we have this incredible young lady who's uh, I'm just proud of every day, even though she's getting ready to be 50. I'm, I'm 70 years old, this is fun. And um, in that time frame, I picked up a couple of college degrees, uh, a lot of experience uh, internationally. Um, Matt, I was the kind of guy that would uh, come off the ship and instead of running around the bars, I would uh, go find where everybody was having f food. And that's where I would eat. Because if there's a lot of the locals eating food there, that means the food is good. Plus, uh, I'm a people watcher. I've always been a people watcher. And when in Europe, the best thing to do is get a cappuccino, sit at a table on a street ca uh, cafe, and just watch people. So I did that for years and years and years. Um, after uh, graduate, or retiring from the U.S. Navy, I didn't know who I was or what I really wanted to do. So I went into a number of different industries and jobs. Uh, late last century, I love saying that, it's so much fun. Uh, back in the 1990s, uh, I was uh, not such a good candidate for hire at senior mid-level and senior positions because in those days, I was a job hopper. Now, um, I've, I've been uh, all the way up to chief operating officer, president, chairman of um, organizations, local, national, and international um, I've written, uh, 10 books, written and or co-written, uh, 10, 10 books now. And as I mentioned earlier, the Earthwind series is going from number one and number two of 13 books planned, uh, are out on the street, all available on amazon.com. And, um, uh, I ran into, first I got a divorce. It was time to move on. And uh, after, shortly after that, within just a few years, I, I uh, came across and uh, instantly fell in love with, yeah, instantly fell in love with my current wife. We've been married uh, over 10 years now, and that hasn't changed. It's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Back in uh, May of 2012, uh, my current company, Evolutionary Healer, LLC was born with my business partner, my wife, and our focus was to coach and assist health and wellness professionals to, to become better business people. And in the last decade, we have evolved into much bigger things. My wife, for instance, right now, Linda Vetris Nichols, she is a coach to her clients 
who has a system to create a back of the room book uh, in 30 days, self-published with their clients. She just has a great time with that. She's written 22 books. Wow. And uh, number 23 is, oh, yeah, that's a good number. is coming out this year too. So she's, she's a writer as well. Uh, most of my adult life, including in the Navy, um, I just have the kind of personality. Uh, well, I'm an old guy now. I'm a pop personality or a father figure. But back in the day when I was younger, like you are, they, uh, people would come up and they, they would trust me with their with their confidence. And uh, I would help them and coach them more, more mentoring than anything else. Uh, after the Navy, I guess uh, somewhere around 15,000 people now over 45 years I've, I've coached and, and assisted. In the last, just, just after the lockdown, um, I started really starting to focus on just mentees and senior mentees. So senior government people, upper middle management uh, to senior levels, the chief executives, uh, work with them on, on moving both themselves and their company. And so that, ladies and gentlemen, is really the short version of how I'm sitting here today talking to you, Matt. Great. Thank you very much for sharing that intro. So with all that equipped knowledge that you've acquired throughout your and life, tell me a little bit more how you're changing people's lives now this stage in what uh, way? one big way is i created and further developed a question and answer sequence uh, that helps our clients uh, go back deep in early childhood in their memories and find an amnesic type memory that controls their repetitive behaviors like ptsd suicide ideation alcoholism is just the list goes on and on and on. The cool part about it is it's not therapy. It's a question and answer sequence to, uh, that we go right online. Uh, we find that that is the best best way to do this so that the, the person is, is comfortable in, in their own space and are, are not aware of another body in the room. So it works quite well. And I have trademarked it. Um, the sequence is called the CR process. The actual uh, sequence itself, the first session of 30, 30 days, uh, is repetitive behavior cellular regression. We use the five senses to get back to the back of the base of the, of the brain and work forward. That's why we work with the five senses. Amnesia is, is a protection device. You're not broken. It's not a disease. It's a protection device and uh, it's designed to protect anything that comes to it down the neural pathway that was originally created uh, for that memory. Extremely successful, well over 95% success through the first year. So that is, is that process. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, uh, we have clients and, and practitioners now on so let's see, six continents, 17 countries, 27 U.S. states. Uh, and we do the CR process in uh, it's either six or seven languages. I don't remember offhand. But that's all come out of an, an idea I had helping a person uh, right on the Internet. I was in uh, Minnesota, upper Midwest of the United States. And the person I was helping with was in Australia. And um, that's evolved into a global, uh, global thing. The, my, now my, my mentees are on uh, three continents. Um, I don't have anybody in the U.S., ladies and gentlemen. I'm open. But uh, it's been great uh, helping senior government officials from a non-political perspective. They love it. They absolutely love it. So... Yeah, that's that's where the CR process came from. Very interesting. Okay, you did tell me about your professional journey. How about moving a little bit further and talking about where you grew up 
and what your childhood was like. My childhood was up and down like a roller coaster, like just about every other child. Uh, I grew up uh, born and raised in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, uh, in the up in the very top part of the state of Idaho. My father was in construction. He uh, ran the region that we were in. So uh, for a number of years, for the first uh, nine years or so, um, life was pretty good. You know, it was a steady income. Um, if I wanted to go to scout camp, I said, I want to go to scout camp. Okay. So my mom and dad fought a lot. And, and so uh, that wasn't easy. One of the big things um, when I was a young child is it was hidden from me, the fact that my brother and I, I have one sibling, um, were not told that my mother and her side of the family uh, were Indians, Native Americans. And there was a reason for that. Chickamaugas traditionally are light-skinned people. I live in Asheville, North Carolina, which is about three hours northeast of, of Atlanta, Georgia. And it turns out this is the homeland of that tribe. But the reason why they did that, because uh, back then and still today, indigenous people are treated differently. That's as nice as I'll put it. And to protect us from that, my mom and dad uh, kept that secret uh, from us until we were uh, adults and could make the decision to then follow the indigenous ways, which is called the Red World, or continue on, on Main Street society. Well, there was a problem. My father died uh, when I was 17. And my mother died when I was 24. And neither of them had a chance to tell my brother and I um, the secret. So that's why it took until I was 46. My brother was nearly 49 when my father's father, my paternal grandfather, told my brother the secret because he knew it right from the beginning. So when going back to early childhood, we, there was never uh, sp spoken anything that was negative about other ethnic groups ever, okay? None of that uh, existed. And even once in a while, my father and or my mother would say, you know, the, the, the Native Americans, the only ones that got any rights in this country because they were the original people. We, you know, Americans, the Europeans stole everything. And I, I hung on to that, but I didn't know why. So now I certainly do know why. So that's a lot about my uh, youth. When my parents divorced when I was about 14, we started traveling. Um, secondary school in uh, the UK is high school over here in America. And I went to seven different high schools in four years. So I was always on a run. I, I had enough credits to graduate from high school at one school and not enough in another. And then uh, that bounced back and forth. Well, my final high school, the seventh one, was the first one, my hometown. And I have plenty of uh, credits to graduate there, but I wasn't sure uh, what the status was. Uh, my father died uh, in the middle of that year. And uh, as it turned out, I had more than enough credits. So it all ended well, and I was able to join the Navy. Great. And it's a moment in your childhood or teenage years where you would want to go back and do things differently? Well, there's a lot of those. There's a lot of those. Uh, I was an A student until my parents started really um, rocking uh, the boat and, and going into very serious arguments and those kinds of things and ultimately divorced. Uh, and my, my grades crashed at that point. So my desire and want to be a, a medical doctor disappeared because my grades were not there. I couldn't even get into college, let alone uh, try out for a medical school. So if I was to do it over again, um, I think that I would search out other members of our family. My, my uncle, my brother's, uh, my father's brother, um, him and his wife um, wanted to take me under their wing uh, and give me a good, uh, 
support system so that I could graduate and go on to college when my father refused. Um, going back now, I would have thrown a fit until that happened. As much as I loved my dad and my stepmother at the time, I knew that I wasn't going anywhere and things had to change. So that would be the number one thing is going back and look at that situation again and sticking up for myself when I knew better. Okay. And what would you say is a habit that you have had a positive impact on your life? And how did you develop it? I've always uh, thought of myself uh, in the present sense. I didn't think too much of the future. I, I set visions for myself at various times in my in my adult life, and I thrive to to achieve those visions. And most of the time, I did. the uh, The experience of growing up with uh no prejudice in the house that kind of talk was not not allowed my filters never created um to to be superior to or inferior to any other ethnic group and because of that i saw everybody as equal so people became friends of mine instantly until they proved otherwise and that has stayed with me all, all my life. And uh, I've always been a kind person. So I'm often say, uh, if you can be anything, be kind, but take no grief, okay? Be yourself, stand up for yourself. That's important. Okay, well, it keeps you motivated when things get very tough and challenging in life. Even though you're helping others at the moments where you're facing difficulties, but have a grip over them and can handle them? If yes, what advice would you give to younger people? Uh, my stepmother, or uh, not my stepmother, my mo current mother-in-law says it very well, this too will pass. Um, you know, um, it's hard. We're emotional people, you know, it's hard. And if you grew up in a situation where your filters uh, created a uh, position of victim all the time. That's where you're going to go. Uh, it's a tough place to be, but it's your most uh, comfortable place because that's where you've been all your life. That's a hard thing to change, a very hard thing to change. And I'm often quoted, uh, presence is the point where manifestation becomes action. So releasing the, the fear and anxiety of the past and the fear and anxiety of the future. All you have is presence. And that at that point is when you'll start to see whatever it is that you're searching for, a way out of the situation. Um, you're, you're trying to create a new service or a product or anything like that. Releasing yourself from all of that self-talk to a place where you can go and it's individual. You know, people think about being out on a beach or or they or whatever. Uh, that's fine. Wherever it is, it's fine. That place where you have comfort, because once you hit the comfort, then the thing that you're searching for becomes more evident. And, and sometimes I really have to sit down and concentrate to get there because there's just so much stuff around me that's interfering with the way I'm, I speak. So. Uh, I take my own teachings and, and say, okay, back off, relax. What's triggering all of this? What sense of my five senses is triggering this? See, I've been through the CR process too. And what memory is associated with that trigger right now? And who am I looking at? Somebody in my memory uh, caused a similar uh, reaction to what I'm doing in present life right now. And I get to chew them out and, and neutralize their hold on me. And I, I tell them, person, I love you and I forgive you so I can love me and forgive me. And man, it works. It just goes, you just relax. Um, and that's not easy either. Uh, folks, reach out to me and, and we can talk about that more. 
Uh, but that's the that's what I do, and and it works. Okay. You've published quite a few books now, and if I wanted to tap into your thinking process, which books would you recommend me to start reading first and follow the journey of all your publications? Well, there are various reasons. Um, uh, one of my books, Profiling for Profit, What Crossed Arms Don't Tell You, tells a lot of, about what they're thinking and their level of trust for you. Now, we're taught that being cross-armed is a protection. Um, our parents did that when we were children, etc. But that doesn't necessarily mean uh, what it implies. And a really good example in the book is I was selling custom clothing to a man and halfway through the presentation, uh, he's standing in front of me with the crossed arms straight at me. And I just stopped the presentation. I said, so how do you want to pay for that? He looks for a second. He goes, ah, visa's good. I said, okay, let's sit down and let's start working with that. And a few minutes later, he sits back and he says, wait a minute. I sell millions of dollars worth of product all over the all over the United States every month. I know how to read people. I gave you a no buy sign and you closed me. How did you do that? So I explained it to him. Ladies and gentlemen, when was the last time you picked up a baby? You put that baby over the heart. So you match yourself heart to heart. That's just where it goes. And what do you do? You drop your your head to the left side, nurturing. OK, trust, nurturing. Well, this gentleman, even though he was taught to cross his arms, he was sitting there like this with his head to the left and uh, his his shoes were pointed straight at me. That means he was completely uh, connected to what I was doing. He trusted me and it, and it was time for him to to buy. He was just going through the, the way he was taught to to do that. And he he goes, that's pretty incredible. Okay, so what's next? And he bought a two thousand dollar suit back in the nineteen nineties. That was a nice sale. So um, profiling for profit, what crossed arms don't tell you, is 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 a book for everybody. Certainly, sales and marketing people. When you uh, talk uh, like we're talking right now, uh, so that you you know that your message is getting through to the person. And they trust you and your authenticity. You got to be authentic. Uh, that's number one. The new business model, especially since uh, uh, lockdown, is consortium. The new business model for the 21st century. To achieve a vision, a shared vision for your company. And the book is, is great. These are what we call airplane books. They're about 100 page, 150 pages. Easily read it on an hour, hour and a half flight. Uh, land at the other end, tell your marketing people to buy the book and off you go. But uh, I'll give you a really good example of what achievement means. If you're the only person in the division or the office or whatever that's working hard and achieving a lot of stuff, your bosses are not going to tell you to slow down and uh, you're going to burn out. They're just going to let you keep going. So what happens? You burn out. However, if everyone in the office is sharing the, uh, the, the anxiety and, and the, not anxiety, the, the achievement, the excitement of achievements, then you feed off of each other's energy. You don't burn yourself out. And it has been my experience when I have that in my, my divisions and in my company, the, the people stay pumped up. And one thing, if they're happy where they are and can't wait to get to work, they're not real keen on working from home. They want to be with other people who are achieving, feed off of that energy. So they come to work. They come to the office. You got that, Mr. and Mrs. CEO? They come to the office. But here's a bigger thing, okay? They're not going to leave the company. They're not going to leave that environment for something else that, that they've traditionally didn't, didn't like. So your retention is, is better. What's that do to the EBIT line? Earnings before interest and taxation it makes it look a lot nicer. So that's what consortium's model is all about. 
Those are the two books that I recommend to everybody. They're available as an ebook too. I tell my, my mentees and my clients, get the ebook version so you have something in your phone to refer to on a regular basis. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing this. What career advice would you give to younger people starting out a new profession or career path in general? Experiment. Okay. Your world's right here. Unlike my world, which was a, a landline. Um, you know, when I was growing up, people were taught, go to a company, work your way in, and you'll find it something good to do there. Well, that's no longer valid. Okay. Multi potentialites are people that have, that have worked different jobs in different places. Uh, because none of us know what we want to do when uh, we start out in life. And uh, through that journey of learning, through experience and education uh, of various ways, formal and informal, we find that we like to do certain types of work, not for a certain type of company. And that's the most important thing. You can change careers all the time. I've changed careers many times. I have been a middle to upper exec management uh, employee in probably 11 different industries, which makes me a very incredible mentor now later on in life. But be happy. If you're not happy with where you're at, get out of there. All they're going to do is wear you down, and that's going to affect your health, it's going to affect the com company that you work at. Leave. Go someplace else. You're not tied down to one type of thing anymore. You know, that's important. You know, your career is not a career anymore. Your journey in life uh, is more important than finding a career uh, in any particular one type of job. Okay, tapping on to that, uh, what you just said, what would you say is the key to a successful and fulfilling life, in your opinion, then? Be happy. Work hard, play hard, learn a lot, help other people. Because the more people that you help, uh, the more people there are out there who will help you when you need it. And uh, more than anything, if you're not happy, nothing around you, your family, um, your coworkers, everyone's suffering. That's no good. It's not worth it, you know? And the only way I can get a lot more is make some changes along the way, okay? I wear much stronger glasses now than I used to. Uh, I can't run 10 miles like I used to. Um, and I, I, my favorite foods when I was in my 30s and 40s, I can't touch them. You know, modifications. Not the same person I was yesterday, let alone 20 years ago. And when you're in search of your next adventure, your outlook and your confidence uh, is much higher than if you're just trying to find the next job. And it's not, there's nothing wrong with going to a fast food restaurant and working there for a while. All right. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you know, work is work. Paycheck's a paycheck. While you're thinking about, while you're looking around, other opportunities. There are a lot of people out there that have two and three part-time jobs because they can't find a full-time job. That's okay, too. Just keep going. All right. Um, you know, life is not a guided tour. Uh, it's a journey to be learned and experienced. So that's the big thing. Okay. And have you ever received a piece of advice that stuck with you throughout your life? If yes, could you share it with me? I would say um, don't take on something that you don't want to do because you'll never be good at it and you won't learn from it. Uh, that was a, that was a strong piece of advice, uh, that I've always stuck with. 
and learn a little bit more. Zig Ziglar, there's a, there's a whole host of motivational speakers that, that pretty well all say the same thing. And that is, you know, learn about the person in front of you, not the prospect. Okay. Treat people like people and they will re- do the same in return. We call it uh, relationship marketing now. Be a friend. If you need something, where are you going to go? If you have a friend, if I have friend Matt who can do what I need, I'm not going to do an internet search. I'm going to contact Matt and he's going to do what I need because I trust him. It's it's relationship, uh, not uh, just numbers. Okay. You're advising a lot of people in your life. What advice would you give younger people facing general challenges throughout their life or periods, how to deal with those? Find some friends. Um, you know, often in corporate life, um, middle and upper uh, middle uh, managers and executives are assigned a mentor in the company to help them out or they find somebody in the company who can help them out. That's not bad. Uh, everybody else, who do you go to? Find people who are like-minded, uh, who are a little ahead of you on, on the road, uh, that can give you another perspective. Um, you know, a true mentee, mentor, um, doesn't tell you what to do. They don't tell you how to make decisions or do anything like that. They give you a perspective of what it is that you're talking about and, and considering. You still make the decision. There are no good decisions and no bad decisions. They're simply decisions. And we're humans. We can change our mind. Okay? Uh, certain times, whether or not to jump out of an airplane with a parachute, once you jump, you can't really take that back. Uh, but day-to-day in the decision-making process is find people that – you trust to tell you what they believe uh, is a is a good response to to the question that you ask them, rather than what they want you to do. They they should tell you what what they think, and allow you to make the decision, because ultimately you're the person making the decision, not some other people. And once you find one of those, you find that you stay with them for a very long time. Uh, You know, mentors usually have mentees. You don't go to a mentor to find answers. You go to a mentor to get information that you trust. That's a big deal. Really big deal. Okay. So do you think the society or the schooling system should be changed to the younger generation better for the future uh, because we're referring to finding a mentor we're living now in a very digital world it's completely different how people interact with each other uh, it's easier in one way and on the other side it's not really great because all everything happens digitally do you think there could be something different that could be implemented in the schooling system to prepare the younger people for for life, to be equipped better in a way, rather than just teaching them the general subjects? I've been a proponent for most of my adult life uh, to require life skills in secondary school, in high school. How to bounce a checkbook, how to fill out job applications, how to look for a job. These are basic skills that people coming out of school, university, everything, have no idea how to do it. And the the cell phone uh, is our best friend. We can talk um, to somebody we trust. I, my mentees, one of the five mentees that I have right now, I've met. The rest of them right here on, on the internet. Uh, but that doesn't make them any more or less of, of a person. The person you talk to is the person you're talking to. And um, when you keep in mind that whatever you bring in 
uh, good experience or bad experience in your personal uh, opinion is a learning situation. You either learn or you learn. And staying in that mindset is, is, is tricky sometimes, uh, but this too shall pass. And you always get to change your mind, you know? Uh, coming out into the world, uh, my first 20 years as an adult in the U.S. Navy, I changed what I thought I would be probably 10, 15 times in that 20 years, okay? Um, when I was eight years old, I wanted to be a doctor. When I was 12 years old, I wanted to be a race car driver. You know, it just is what it is at the time. And we get to change our mind. Now I'm, I'm not even close to either of those professions. Uh, and I'm very happy with where I'm at because my journey in life created the opportunities for me to find me. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. I think for the final question, would you have any words of wisdom to the younger generation? anything at all that you would want to pass on apart from whatever you already shared? Life's a journey, not a guided tour. When everything seems to be going wrong, just keep going. You'll come out of a storm. And remember, um, the worst part of any storm, a hurricane, cyclone, whatever, is just before it's over maximum sustained winds, all of the stuff going around in your life at the moment is about to be over, okay? Just keep moving and uh, you'll be all right. The big thing is find people you trust that you can talk to. And you're never alone in this world, okay? There's always somebody with a smile on their face that you can smile back to. So if you do anything, take, take this advice, smile at everybody and acknowledge them as a person. The person uh, opening the door for somebody who's driving a taxi makes no difference. Smile at them. They're a person and they'll smile back because they've been acknowledged as a person. That's, that's the thing to go through life with because your life has a, a much higher uh, tendency to be uh, what you're looking for when you just allow love to come out and acknowledgement of people. That's how I would end that, I would think. Terry, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom experiences and stories i really appreciate you taking the time today to speak to me well, thank you man i'm very very grateful for this i think this is going to be very valuable uh, and it's going to pass some interesting things to to other people watching this um, and i really hope we're gonna get to speak to each other again stay in touch it's just the beginning of the journey right. it is reach out anytime uh, um, you're a fine fellow and what you're doing here is is relative and it's on point. Congratulations.